Hello again, beautiful people, and welcome back to another episode of The Culture. Now, today with me, I have another dear friend of mine. But before I get into that, also, I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who supported us in the first episode of Deep Culture, the episode where I interviewed Manisha Delani. Uh, we have over 31 people streaming that episode right now. So keep it up, and if you will continue to like it, hopefully we can do even more of this as we progress. All right. Without further ado, today I have a dear friend of mine with me. Uh, she, we are secondary school friends, right? Even though we weren't very close back in secondary school. But we reconnected after a while. And right now, she's actually a special education teacher who helps students with cerebral palsy and multiple disabilities. She also has very interesting experiences from her solo trips, which include the working holiday scheme where you can travel to New Zealand for nine months. Right, so today I have her on with me to share a little bit more about her experiences on her solo trips and the working holiday scheme, as well as what it's like to be a special education teacher. So, without further ado, Madam Esther Liao, welcome to Deep Culture. Thank you for your very warm welcome. How are you doing, mate? How are you doing? <laughs> wow, you're bringing Hi. out the accent right from the start. Right? <laughs> yes. Thank you for this very great honor to appear on your grand ch- ch- channel. It is my oh, you're welcome. life's greatest accomplishment. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Yes. How so, are you doing? Good, good. Um, it's a Saturday. I'm glad to take a break on a Saturday. Yes, and I'm glad to spend my yeah. I'm glad to spend my afternoon with you. So, oh, that's so nice. Yeah. I'm glad to spend it with you too. <laughs> yes. So, hi. I think I should introduce myself. <laughs> okay. Sure. So, hi. My name is Esther, and as Fali said, we were secondary school friends. So this is you know, funny because. When we were in secondary school, Fali and I were never really very close. So I was always very quiet. <laughs> when Fali was this like really good prefect that played floorball. So we never really had, I don't know, much conversations together. But he was always like a very father figure. So I remember father there was this figure. once. I do, yeah, I don't know if you remember this. So there was this once we were in class actually. So... I don't know, like the boys were teasing the girls around me. So, you know, you were trying to, the boys were trying to like steal their items, like take their wallet away. Then the girls would be like, I know, give me back my items. And the boys were like, nah, I'm not going to give you back your items. So you were there also and you were stealing like, I don't know, like Shirley's items or something. And then you saw me and you came to me. Yeah, yeah. So you saw me and you came to me and you were like, Esther is too sweet, la. I cannot steal her item. I feel very bad. <laughs> so I went, oh, this one's gonna be a good guy in the future. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But yeah, when but you say we, stealing, uh, we, it wasn't actually stealing, right? No, la, I mean, I, I don't even like, recall you know, this, Esther. <laughs> I know, it, it was like the playful teasing, you know, like boys, I don't know, they okay. thought at that point of time, they think it's very cool to like take girls' items away and then like, you know, let the girls run after them and everybody's like, ah! Chase me, chase me! Yeah. <laughs> so that, that was one of my earliest memories of you, Hartley. I'm well, sure you don't remember the that. Thanks for the throwback. I don't remember that one so yeah. much. But I can, Yeah. I think I, yeah, that sounds like me. <laughs> Yeah, huh. sounds like you should. Huh. Like, yeah, but we were never really like <laughs> close until I don't know two years, three years ago. So it's very funny, like mm. how some friendships are only formed after you become an adult. I think. Right, yeah. and that two years or three years ago was that was almost ten years after secondary school, right? After we left yeah, second, secondary school. Yeah, it was. Yeah. We we never so connected a... after secondary school at all. I think. Hmm. I think we did meet once at the um when our secondary school was closing down. And then we oh, all yes, came we back did. for the reunion. Yeah, yeah we did. that was the one time we Yeah, so that that was, you know, by circumstance, not by by choice. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. So what else are you doing, Esther? What else do we need to know about you? Oh, uh, I like to introduce myself to people as an introvert. But like a lot of people don't believe me. (laughs) No, I'm not kidding. Look at these people. They don't believe me. So I'm really an introvert. So I I need like a lot of personal space. And I like being like 
at home doing my own thing. Mm-hmm. But then at the same time, I like exploring. So may- maybe it's okay. Maybe a more apt term would be like ambivert. So I can be okay. either. But I think I'm still more to the introvert spectrum. No, I, I mean I, I need a lot of my personal space to like do my own thing. Ah. So mm. and what do and you I do in very, your personal? Hmm? What do you do in your own my personal, personal time? time? So when I'm in Singapore. If I'm feeling adventurous enough, I like to go and explore. Mm-hmm. So, like, one of the, I don't know, few places that I went to explore in Singapore was actually Fort Canning. Have you been there? Mm-hmm. When was the last time you went to Fort Canning? Uh, I think my last, the last time I was working with the consultancy agency. So, it was right beside Fort Canning. So, I used to pass by the place a lot. Oh, ah, yeah. okay, okay. So, maybe you do know about Fort Canning, but, you know, like, Maybe when I was younger, I never really appreciated like history very much. But <laughs> right? as I get older, I was like, "Wow, Fort Canning! Do you know what is at Fort Canning? Fort Canning has like an archaeology, an archaeological site mm-hmm. where they actually dug up the ground and they found like artifacts in Singapore from like I don't know, 13th century, I think, many many like years ago. Yeah, oh, I didn't you know, know that. that. Yeah, I know so it for it the site, heritage. Yeah. Harry, what Harry? <laughs> I know they have a yeah, few so heritage have, like, centers. Like, yeah. yeah, so it's really cool. Like they have an archaeological site, right? So when I went there, they dug like I think four or five layers of soil, mm-hmm. and then they found, you know, items that were from other countries. So for example, they would find like I don't know ceramic or porcelain from like Thailand, deep okay. in the soil from many years ago. So that is like suggestive of trade that happened between Singapore and another country mm. back then, way back. Yeah, so I think it's very cool that you can tell a country like history from, I don't know, digging up the soil and excavation. At some point, they did open the excavation to the public, but I, I don't know why, I just never heard about it. And right. maybe I was just not interested in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, 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 sorry. Mm-hmm. And mm. it houses, like, the supposed tomb or the burial site of Singapore's last like ancient king. Yeah, that one yeah, I know. So, That's the heritage thing that I was yeah, talking about. <laughs> yeah, so it's called a uh, Garabat, I think. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I thought it was pretty cool. So I went to explore. I've been trying to like, you know, find out where I come from. <laughs> what are Your my family roots. line? At some point, yeah, I mean at some point I considered like doing a DNA test like, but I don't know how accurate and like Hmm. I mean, there are risks about sending such personal data all the way to another company. You don't know what they're going to do with it. So, right. I, it's okay. I will accept that I'm ethnically Chinese. <laughs> no matter what blood may run deep in my veins. Actively Malay. <laughs> <laughs> Actively Malay. Good, good on you. <laughs> good on you too, Esther. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I like to tell people that I do have like some <laughs> British blood, but that was like never confirmed, you know. So anyway, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Back to your question. I'm sorry. What were you saying? Nothing. I wasn't saying anything. <laughs> sorry. But you had to bring out the British accent. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. So how about we start off with how we reconnected. So how we reconnected had something to do with your travels, right? You went, you were on a, I think mm-hmm. I remember seeing your post on Facebook. Uh, you were traveling to Hanoi, Vietnam? Hanoi, yeah. Yeah, yes. and then I saw your cool pictures and then at that point of time, I was thinking like, you know, oh, wow, I I still haven't gone for my first solo trip, but here she is, you know, all the way out in Hanoi. So I reached out to Esther and I was like, hey, Esther, How's everything? I hope you're doing well. Uh, could you maybe share with me about how you settled your solo trip? Like, how did you plan it? How did you organize it? And how was it? What was your experience like? And from there, when we connected, then she started sharing with me. And, and then we realized that we had more in common. Uh, mm. So that's where we stayed friends ever since. Right? So maybe you want to share a bit more about your experience with uh, your solo trip to Hanoi and Vietnam. Yeah, sure. So... The very first time that I took a solo trip overseas was to Hanoi, as Fatli mentioned, and I think that was in 2017. Mm-hmm. So I think that came after, I don't know, like a pretty low season in my life. 
and I told myself, okay, I need to go and see the world a little bit, and mm. I need to go and like meet new people. And I always wanted to travel alone by myself, but I've never, I don't know, I just never made the made the decision to do it. Mm-hmm. So I felt that okay, I'm gonna do it, and I wanted to go to a country that is not too comfortable. I mean, I could have chosen like Australia or like America because hmm. they speak English too as well, right? <laughs> like the Singaporeans do. But yeah. yeah. But I, I wanted to go somewhere like totally different and like challenge myself to survive. So I picked mm-hmm. Hanoi because I obviously can't, you know, speak Vietnamese at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but to be fair, I had a friend who did go to Hanoi um, quite recently. So he did share with me like the name of a contact um, who was a guide there when doing the trek. Yeah, other mm-hmm. than that, it was my first time living in a hostel. Mm. and like finding a hostel you know getting transport to the hostel and getting around by myself right and it was a very interesting experience because um i couldn't read the signs there (laughs) and i had no friends there and Mm -hmm. i was forced to ask questions when i was in help when i needed Mm. help and to trust my sense of direction right yeah um yeah, but it was very memorable because, you know, one of the things I, I took back most from the Hanoi trip was actually cycling through, like, um, rice paddies, I think. Mm. And it was actually pouring on that day. So this was a group tour right. with, you know, other people that I didn't know. <coughs> mm-hmm. So there were, like, couples there. They were, like, father and daughter. And then there was me. And, myself. <laughs> and then it started to pour. So we were raining and it started to pour. And we actually cycled through flat waters. Oh. And I've never done that in Singapore because Singapore doesn't flood, right? I mean, mm. thank goodness it doesn't flood. But <laughs> it flooded there. And then the guy, he contemplated for a while. He was like, okay, should we still bring this group of inexperienced city life people <laughs> through, this, through this flat water? And in the end, he was like, come, let's have fun. Let's go do this. So all of us really cycled. You went through. I got through. <laughs> yeah, we went through. I have, a, I have a picture. I should send it to you. Yeah, so we did it. And it was very fun because it was something I never got to do in Singapore. Mm-hmm. And the thought of being like a bit, I don't know, doing something unconventional was just a bit ex- exciting. Mm. Yeah. So that was one. What about before you even went to Hanoi? How was it? I mean, when you brought it up to your parents, how would how did they take it? <laughs> I mean, honestly, I bought the flight. I made the decision first, <laughs> and then I was like, hey, "I'm, I'm going to solo travel." <laughs> I think I was very determined at that point. Mm. I was like, "Okay, I'm, I'm gonna do this no matter what," and I'm an adult, so I've never survived in another country by myself. Honestly, I don't know if how it's gonna go. Mm. I just pray I don't get kidnapped, but I didn't. <laughs> and but as, to a certain extent, I trusted myself, and I just chose to do it. Hmm. And I choose to believe that. I mean, no matter where you are in the world, there are going to be people who who can help you if there are good really people out there. Any trouble? Yeah, and I feel like it has been true for me so far. So far, humanity has not really failed me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are like weird, there are like weird people overseas and uh-huh. in Singapore. Like people who will try to take advantage of you, right? But I think for the for the most part, people are are, are just very genuine. Mm. It's just that I think culture we we're, we're not brought up to, I don't know, meet people from other countries as much, or maybe it's just like my my upbringing and my circle of friends. We we don't really like you know mingle with people from other countries. Mm. Yeah, or maybe Singapore. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. it's a mix of both. Actually, I think. Given that we both stay here in Pasir Ris, I think that plays a part as well. Yeah. Like I think if we were both like yeah. mainly in the city area where there's a lot more uh, foreigners or expats, yeah, yeah, then I think we'd probably be mixing around yeah. with different people from different countries and all that. But then again, even in se- yeah. I mean, even in neighborhood schools, we hardly have any contact with. Uh, yeah, exactly. Foreign- I was just thinking of that. You know, when we look back at our school days, I don't remember like having much. I don't know, like kids from other countries in our, our schools. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I would think most of them do go to like expat schools or like international schools. Yeah. Um, but again, I, I think it really depends on upbringing and, and the 
environment that you're in because I do have like Singaporean friends who are very you know globally minded right and yet they've attended like neighborhood schools mm. so I think it's a matter of environment and the people that you are around yeah that's true yeah what's the biggest thing that you find uh, the difference between you know communicating with the locals and communicating with somebody from a foreign country you mean locally like in Singapore compared to yeah someone from a foreign country mm-hmm. well I feel like, again, it depends on the individual, mm-hmm. but I do feel like people overseas are a bit more, I don't know, open-minded. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they are generally more accepting of different views or different lifestyles. I mean, a lot of things that can be controversial here in Singapore, but overseas <laughs> people, people ask questions, you know, and, mm. and I feel like people there are at least the people that I've met, they are just genuinely very curious about the world and like, I don't know, politics and <laughs> and how countries function. So right. like, I've had people come to me and they will be like, hey Esther, nice to meet you. Can you tell me more about your country's history? <laughs> so that is like an icebreaker. Right? That is an icebreaker that they have. Mm. But in Singapore, nobody, nobody does that. If you nobody. go to like... If, <laughs> No one Singaporean really talks about like their country's history. They will just be like, what? "Really, you're gonna talk about Sang Nila Utama?" Yeah, <laughs> let's talk about bubble tea. Let's talk about <laughs> yeah. Kind of... So like, yeah. I don't know. Again, it really depends on the crowd, but I think the quality of conversation and like the kind of things they talk about are a bit different. Hmm. Yeah, so they were, my friends will ask me things. Like, I have, I have a really good friend from Peru. Mm-hmm. So, hey, Stephanie. So, <laughs> we have a lot of, like, discussions about a lot of things. So, she would come and tell me about things like how, you know, in her country, um, people and the men there can be very, what's their word? Macho, I think. Okay. No. Yeah. I can't think of the word at the moment. But, you know, like, That's the men there tend to dominate. Yeah, something along those lines. Like, mm. they, they tend to feel like they're over women and you know women have to listen to them and then she'll be like yeah i believe a lot in female empowerment and things like this mm-hmm. which i don't hear talked about very much you know here in singapore mm. so i don't know maybe it's just the people that i've met also so conversations so, are different mm. when you are with people of other cultures and did you realize that mainly when you were in vietnam from your first experience no in the I- Mm, not really. So actually, in ha- in Hanoi, I did like hang out with my dorm mates mm-hmm. once. So that was the first time I actually made friends with people from like Netherlands, Germany, Korea, and we went for like a uh, coffee together. Ah, but okay. I think the bulk of my learnings came from my travel after that. So after Hanoi, I saw a little bit of the world, and I was like, okay, <laughs> I need to see a lot more because there's so much I need to learn, and I want to go and live in a country. Mm-hmm. So in twenty. 20- 18, I think. Yeah. I went on a New Zealand working holiday. Mm, tell us a yeah. bit so more this about is what's actually, that. Mm. Yeah. So this <laughs> is actually a working holiday scheme between Singapore and New Zealand where you can apply for a visa mm-hmm. and you can legally work in New Zealand. So okay. the moment, you know, you apply for the visa, you pay a certain amount of money, I think about $200, and they approve your visa, you're good to go. But all your accommodations and your work arrangements have to be settled by yourself when you land in New Zealand. So, um, I mean, in total, I was in New Zealand for about nine months. And that was a very (laughs) eye-opening. But I don't, honestly, I don't think it's a very long period of time compared Mm -hmm. to people who live there for years or migrate to another place for years. Nine Mm -hmm. months is actually very short, but it was eye-opening for me. Um. Living there and working there and taking on like a lot of jobs that I would never have done in Singapore. Mm-hmm. So like, I, I think I worked in a total of like seven, seven jobs. <laughs> so okay. can, I, can I list them for you? Please, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> so like the first job was picking kiwis from the orchard. Oh, okay. And then the second job was working in the kiwi pack house. So after you pick the kiwis, I mean, they need to be packed, right? They go somewhere. Right. So I worked in a kiwi, 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 kiwi <laughs> pack house. And okay. after that, I went to like an apple pack house. You need to pack apples too, right? Mm-hmm. Then, uh, oh dear, I'm losing track. 
But I, I worked in a pizza factory for a while. A pizza? You know, it's not... It's, yeah, but it's the frozen pizza kind. Okay. I should okay. send you some photos. Like frozen pizza kind. Mm-hmm. So it's the kind that you go to NUC, you know, they are pre-packaged. Right, right. So they all came from somewhere. They came from a factory. <laughs> yeah. I worked in a salt factory. Mm-hmm. So it was linked to the sea where they actually made, you know, the evaporated the seawater and then oh. made salt. So I was involved in like preparing the bottles where the salt were going. So it was a lot of machines. It was quite cool. Um, I also worked in a, I worked cool. in a wine bottling factory for one day. One day. So, you know, you got to see like how the, yeah, so like it was casual labor. So it's an on-call basis. So it was only one day. Okay. You didn't need me. So. so like, yeah, you got to see like the wine, how they go inside the bottles and the whole process. So it's mm-hmm. a very step-by-step basis. Like, you know, the wine factory is opposite a distillery. So they have like these huge tubes that connect the distillery to the factory. Mm-hmm. And then it's bottled in the factory and then it you know there is stickers being pasted on the bottle and eventually you need people to put labels and tags on the bottle so it, yeah. it's really like a, i don't know like an assembly line and yeah. what was your so there job was one my job in that my job there was to put tags on the on the the wine bottle so you know when the wine is done like being packaged kept the wine is inside the sticker is there already mm-hmm. right so yeah. they need to make it look nice before it goes to the store so you need to put like a little tag on top of the <laughs> on top of the the bottle right i don't know uh-huh. like with the company details or something so literally we stood at the assembly line every bottle that came down we're just like put put the tag on quick 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 <laughs> stick, stick the tag on. <laughs> yeah. so that's all you need for one whole yeah. day <laughs> uh, the other thing was to pack like six six bottles in a carton, something oh. like this. So mm. the machine will come, they will bring six bottles together and you need to quickly put the cardboard over the machine. Right. So that, you know, it can be, yeah. That was one. Then after that, I worked in a vineyard as well, but, oh. but not drinking wine. I was in the vineyard as like, you know, like the Ghostbusters. I take the, take the huge tank and yeah. spray like, you know, fun, fun, fungi side on the, on the vineyard stuff. I thought the you vines? were a scarecrow or something. Yeah. Like, no, I'm not scary now. I'm so stupid. Yeah. yeah, like, so every day my job was to carry this 10, 10 kg liter of liquid. And mm. then we had to walk up and down a total of about 240, you know, lines mm. of vines. Mm. And each line down from the start to the end took like half an hour. Wow. So it will be very annoying sometimes when you are only halfway through the, you know, like the line and then mm. you run out of liquid. Yeah, then so you have to hit, oh my god. You need to walk all the way to the other end, put back the liquid and walk back and then start spraying again. And the problem is that when there is a whole line of vines in front of you, everything looks the same. Mm. You can't tell like where you stop. So we had to, you know, use like a stick, like those loose sticks to mm. leave it on the the vine that we stopped so that it's a little marker to tell ourselves, okay, we stopped at this particular vine. We need to continue from ah, here later. Okay. Yeah, so that was our job every day. But it was so nice because every morning you woke up, you know, sometimes the, the grass is still frosted. There's a layer of ice on it because when I went, it was nearing winter. Mm-hmm. So like, it frosted. And then oh, we got to drive. The first uh, taste of snow? No, it wasn't. it wasn't. No, but can I tell you about my can I tell you about my snow experience? Yeah, please. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> so one of my greatest dreams in life is mm-hmm. to see snow. Okay. And of course I can't do that in Singapore other than go to Snow City. <laughs> yeah. But um so I got my dream come true in New Zealand. The first time I ever saw snow was when I went skiing. Mm-hmm. And that was beautiful because everything was snow. And you know, the moment the bus goes up the mountains, you start to see some snow on the sides already. Oh, okay. And then I got really excited. I was looking out the bus like, yeah, snow, 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 snow. <laughs> And the rest of like, you know, the Caucasians who are like used to snow, they're just like, <laughs> like <laughs> Asians. <laughs> Because I went with two Malaysian friends. One of mm-hmm. them has lived in America and she doesn't like snow, so she's used to it. Right. And the other Malaysian friend has never seen snow either. So the two of us were the ones cramming, like, 
You're you know, big fanatics. You go over like that. <laughs> oh my god, so freaky, so yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you managed to play in the snow and everything, right? Yes. So the moment we got off the bus and I reached out my hand and touched my first <laughs> grip of snow, that was a magical moment in my life. What yeah, but I mean, snow? other than that, I don't know. It's just magical, you know. Hmm. And then I also realized that building a snowman is actually very hard. <laughs> <laughs> we built Frosty the snowman and he was only like this tall. Mm-hmm. This tall, and it took like I don't know half an hour. Why? What's so the, I always what's imagine it. Like, oh my gosh, you have to try. So it, I don't know. It's just heavy. It's not easy to manipulate. It's not like squishy snow. Mm-hmm. So it it takes a lot of work. So you you have to carry the snow over to one place and you pat it down. Mm. Then you take another ball and you pat it down. And it takes the whole process. Just takes very long. Really? And uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe we have no <laughs> skill because we are inexperienced. No people. <laughs> but Frosty came out in the end and he was this big. Did you have a photo of Frosty? Yes. I'm going to send it to you. Frosty. Okay, sure. It's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that was still not the most like magical moment with snow. Mm-hmm. So I'm very excited talking about snow. Yeah. Um, I think the most magical moment was when I was driving with my friends. So we were taking a road trip around the South Island in New Zealand. Mm-hmm. And we were driving and driving and suddenly we saw that the whole patch of trees in front of us were all white. And I started to go, oh my god, oh my god, <laughs> the entire The entire environment was white. Mm. And it was... It was surprising because where we came from, it wasn't like that, you know. Then when the car drove past, the the roads were white, the trees mm. were white. And then I was like, oh, this is the most magical moment of my life. Aww. Yeah, even better, you know, when at certain places, it starts to really snow and you see the snowflakes coming down. You're just like, oh. mm. <laughs> am I alive? Yeah. So, so that's snow. That's snow. That's awesome. So, what else about New Zealand did you enjoy the most? There were a lot of experiences, but I feel like my biggest takeaway was um, making friends mm. from people from other countries. Because back in 2017, I was setting my New Year goals, as always. We feel very inspired. Okay. Inspire you too. So, <laughs> I sat down and I wrote my goal. One of my goals I wrote and I typed it was to make more international friends. Oh. And at that point, I had like zero international friends and I mm-hmm. didn't know how I was going to do it. I mean, I briefly heard about this working holiday thing, but I was like, okay, I'm going to make it happen. Right. And yay, it happened. So I so, guess that was my biggest takeaway. How many international friends do you have now? I don't know. I haven't counted. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, uh, I've met a lot of people along the way. Yeah. We still keep in contact. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, my closest friends just happen to be from South America. Hey, I'm not Spanish. You are Spanish. <laughs> so, sí, but, sí. yeah. <laughs> sí, sí, I'm not Spanish. Sí, sí. I don't know. I, I don't really count. Because you really meet a lot of people along the yeah. way. From everywhere. Yeah, in different mm. continents. So, why solo traveling, though, Esther? Like, why you could, solo traveling? You could travel, like, with your family. You could travel with friends, but... And especially for me, one of the things that uh, piqued my interest when I saw you traveling uh, alone to Hanoi initially, right, was that especially looking back at how you were in secondary school, even like <laughs> to, the, to the story that you shared, like you're too sweet for me to steal stuff from, right? Oh. And then suddenly it's like here I'm looking at uh, somebody who's very introverted, who's very, um, how do I put it, uh, keeps to herself and she's not like the outgoing time. I, I didn't see you, I, I don't even remember seeing you do much during uh, physical, uh, what do you call it, PE, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like it's it. like, <laughs> the moment I saw you taking a, your own first solo trip, I was like, uh, you inspired me because I was like, I've been waiting for years to do this. But I never did it. So uh-huh. why solo trips for you? What is it about solo trips that you uh, love so much? I like that I can do whatever I want. Mm-hmm. honestly, and meet whoever I want. Yeah, I mean, my friends are awesome. It's fun when we travel together in a group. 
But I think it's different when you're traveling alone because you are really more alert and you are forced to be aware of your surroundings and you are forced to open up to people. Yeah, so I like that kind of exchanges that you have with other people, which you may not have if you are traveling in a group or even with your family because it's just very comfortable and you're just there to enjoy each other's company. Right. So I feel like the purpose of those trips are very different. Hmm. And I really like traveling alone because I get my space, I get to meet people, I get to learn, I get to go at my own speed. Yeah. So is it the vulnerability that, that, that you're looking for? vulnerable yeah is it like because when you're meeting new people you're in a new country you're vulnerable to a lot of things right you don't know the culture you don't know how they, mm-hmm. the language that they're, they're speaking so is it the case of you looking to be vulnerable once again instead of like being uh, in a comfort zone of your home or your family for that matter i guess so yeah i guess so but I- to be fair i think it depends on the goal of the trip like if you are just there to rest and relax Mm-hmm. then of course you may not want to like interact with the locals as locals in that country as much but if i'm there traveling by myself it means that i'm there i mean like what you said maybe to be vulnerable to meet people and yeah i guess the goal is just very different hmm. and do you think it's for everyone solo trips i cannot prescribe to everyone <laughs> for sure and right. to be honest to be really really honest i think to be able to travel by myself or even travel for that matter is a first world privilege. Mm, it's true. not an opportunity that everyone has. So I definitely cannot say that you have to go on a solo trip to change your life <laughs> or like broaden your horizons because number one, not everybody has that kind of privilege. Right. So I'm not sure if you've seen that movie called Parasite recently. No, no, I haven't yet. Okay, I can't spoil it for you, but <laughs> okay. there was this scene where it was very obvious how the rich and the poor mm-hmm. perceive like a bad situation. One of, you know, like the poor people are, you know, badly affected by by whatever happened. It was a natural disaster. <laughs> okay. while, the rich, the, while the rich people were actually going like, oh, wow, uh, it was so, you know, so rainy yesterday. We should have a barbecue today. Mm. Something like this. So the disparity is there. And I definitely can't say that everybody has to do it or because not everybody has the means to do it. And I feel very lucky that I can. Mm -hmm. Um, That's one. Number two, there's always a lot of debate about whether, oh, okay, travel is going to change your life or, you know, make you a better person and things like this. Do you agree with that? In my case, yes, I've learned a lot and I think mm-hmm. I have grown as a person through traveling. Mm-hmm. But if you were in a community already where there are a lot of, I don't know, international friends and or you are brought up to be very globally minded, then I don't think, I don't know, going overseas might be much of a difference to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think it's good to be globally minded, but... To say that it's a must, I don't know. I, I can't conclude that it's a must. You mentioned globally minded a couple of times, Ray. So, like, what exactly do you mm-hmm. mean globally minded? I think globally minded to me means being aware of the fact that you're not the only country on the planet. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, a lot of people are aware that there are countries that exist outside of your local country. But to mm-hmm. them, those are just like holiday destinations or like places you will go and check off your bucket list. Right. But... To me, being globally minded is knowing that the people in those countries are very real and mm. and like those are real lives, you know, and being yeah. like interested to understand why people live the way they live, why, mm. who, what makes them who they are and what makes them different, I don't know, different from us. Right. And being curious, you know, about the state of the world. To me, that's being globally minded. Hmm. And what do you think is yeah. down to parenting that some kids are globally minded and some are not globally minded? I think parenting makes a big difference because I do see it among my friends. Mm. So, you know, if you, you have parents that grew up, I don't know, working in, I don't know, for example, maybe MNC where they interact with a lot of internationals or where they travel a lot yeah. or where they, I don't know, do humanitarian work, the kind mm-hmm. of things you hear 
on a daily basis would be right. different from a parent who say goes to a company nine to five, comes home, fits the bill, watches mm. TV. Yeah, not not to say that there's anything wrong with that, but I, I do think parenting plays a part. But as you transit into adulthood, I think who you are is a matter of the choices you make. Yeah. Definitely. So there are people that I don't know, develop this sense of global awareness, I guess. Hmm. Yeah. I still feel like I have a lot long way to go, but I hope I can become that kind of person. Yeah, I think you're well on your way. Much more than me, Aww, I guess. Aww, <laughs> No, what's so sweet? <laughs> Aww, finally. Okay, so now, <laughs> leading on to the second subject, from there, how did you get into this special education uh, occupation? Mm. I actually worked at the where I'm working at, okay, mm-hmm. which is a special needs organization, even before I went to New Zealand. Mm-hmm. So backstory, I was working in advocacy and marketing in this special needs organization for about two years. Oh, and then okay. I decided to take like a gap year in New Zealand. And then I came back to the same organization um, because I wanted to work with the people on the ground. Okay. Back when I did advocacy work, we used to find volunteers. We used to bring in partnerships from like businesses so they would sponsor maybe outings for our clients to i don't know gardens by the bay or they will you know sponsor things like children's day Mm. which were all very meaningful work i really enjoyed it but i felt that i wanted to understand the real needs on the ground Ah, so that's when i decided to try you know become a special education teacher okay but what is it about what was it that drew you to that though that you want the need to understand the people on the ground I wanted to work with lives, like real lives. Because when we did marketing, you know, and advocacy, we shared a lot about what the organization's mission is, Mm -hmm. the kind of work we do. And it was meaningful. But I felt that I also didn't really know the clients as well Mm -hmm. as the teachers did or as the, you know, the staff that worked with them did. So I wanted to, I really wanted to connect with people on another level. So that's mm-hmm. when I ventured into teaching. Yeah, it, it's definitely a different ball game. But, right. you know, in teaching and working in a special needs organization, I feel like I see the, the world a bit, I don't know, differently. Because every day you're around kids, you know, with, so I, the kids that we work with are between 7 to 18. They have cerebral palsy or multiple disabilities. Um, when I when when I go to work every day, I see kids who are not able to walk, kids who are not able to talk, or kids that are not able to maybe eat by themselves. They need to be tube fed, you know. Mm. They they take a liquid diet. I feel like I see a very real side of life, and you know, on a day to day basis, our friends, most of our friends, don't have disabilities, you know. Mm-hmm. But when I come to work, I see a whole different side of Singapore. Like, these are the number of kids with disabilities. And these are very real families mm. who, who, to a certain extent, although they love the kid, they struggle as well. So I see a very real side of life. And it's a privilege to me to be able to have an opportunity to teach and do what I can. Right. Yeah. So, so that's the thing, you see, Esther. I feel like you actually, you mentioned the word real. You see the real side of Singapore, mm. you see the real side of people, right? It does the same thing also the way you describe the uh, global, what do you call it? Global mindset, mm-hmm. right? When you say that, you know, yeah. people know about people from other countries, that there are other countries, but you don't really know about the people there, the lives that they are going through, right? And that's the real mm. side of things. So that's one of the things why I, I was really interested in getting you on the podcast to discuss about this because you have this certain point of view about getting deep, like the, the title suggests, deep culture. So <laughs> don't laugh, as I'm praising you here. <laughs> I know. All right, I'm responding to your compliment. That's right. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, so when you see this real side of Singapore, of uh, or rather this real side of lives, right? What is it that you get out of it? What is the feeling that you get that inspires you to continue to want to do more of it? I feel like, I don't know, okay, it's about to get philosophical. Okay. <laughs> I think at the end of the day or at the end of my life, 
I don't want my life to be about like a paper chase mm. or about being subject to this economy that trades by money. Okay. I feel like at the end of the day, what really matters in life is about people. Mm. Yeah. So of course, if it's about people, I want to know the real side of them. And I think that's what gives a lot of meaning to life. The connections that you have, the conversations that you make, that makes life, I don't know, enriching. And then that builds the connection between you and other people as well. Ah, uh, okay. And I, don't know, I guess I'm just very drawn to the idea of authenticity and being real. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you know, like no need to pretend, just do what you want, help people, care for people. How important is it to you to be authentic? Very important, I think. Do you think you're authentic? I think I am. Yeah. <laughs> honestly. I try, I try. At least I try to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Especially in the relationships with the people closest to you, whether it's your boyfriend, girlfriend, I don't know, your good friends, your family. Yeah. Show your true selves. Or else, at the end of the day, do you really want people to say, oh, actually, I realized I don't really know like this guy or this girl. I don't know what what goes through his mind. I don't know what he wants. What's his passion? Hmm. No, and be known. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry to detract away from your story just now, but yeah, so you were mentioning special education. You were getting to know the real side of Singaporeans. What were some of the greatest experiences or greatest lessons you've learned so far in your short career as a special education teacher? Wow. A lot, I think. Um... I salute the caregivers for mm-hmm. the amount of love they have for their children. Of course, that is parent. That is just part of being a parent. You give birth to a child, no matter how much, I don't know, disabilities <clears throat> they, they may be born with or they may develop over time. I salute the amount of care and the amount of time and amount of money they spend for the child. And this tells me a lot about love. Like, mm. I see love from the caregivers every day. You know, when the child falls sick, they start to worry. And I mean, last year was a very meaningful moment for me because it was my first year teaching, right? Mm-hmm. And I was teaching children who were more on the severe spectrum. Okay. So they are like non verbal They are not able to feed by themselves. They can't toilet by themselves. They are, I mean, put bluntly, they are a bit like babies. Mm-hmm. Um, they were very cute, of course, and I love interacting with them, you know, singing songs with them and telling stories uh-huh. and helping them to develop, you know, like their gross motor skills, whether it's learning to sit up and balance by themselves, learning to use their muscles, because some of their muscles are very tight if it's cerebral palsy. So, you know, like their, their fists are like clenched. Okay. So whether it's doing exercises with them to just help to release that kind of muscle, you know, muscle tone and muscle tension. That was a learning curve and it's it's very interesting. It's very meaningful. Mm-hmm. But last year, I had a student who was seven years old mm-hmm. and she had this condition called trisomy 18. She was so cute. Um, but unfortunately, nearing the end of the year, she passed away. She passed away? Yeah. Okay. She passed away, yeah. So I was very surprised. It was actually during, I think, December holidays. So school had already ended. We were like, okay, bye. See you next year. You know, mm. yeah, continue to tie your two very cute ponytails. I will see you next year. But like in the middle of the school holidays, I had a text from her helper saying, uh, teacher as the uh, she, you know, student went to heaven already, became angel already. I was like, what? <laughs> and, and that caught me by surprise. And mm-hmm. of course, we were very sad. So we were there for the funeral. I was there for the cremation. And I tried not to cry, but I couldn't control myself. Were you close? But it me? made me realize like, how, um, I wouldn't say we're super close, but of course, we worked together in that mm. one year as a as teacher and student. So, and then you get to know like the family and the amount of love like the helper and the, the family gave to her. Mm-hmm. And... Yeah, again, it made me see how fragile life is and how real, sorry, I used the word real again, like how real life can be. (laughs) On a regular basis, you don't see seven-year-old kids passing away. But because I work in a special needs organization, I see how, you know, lives are very fragile and very important. And precious. 
yeah, you know, they might be one child to the entire world, just another another life. Mm -hmm. But to their family, they are everything. They are their child. They gave all their resources into caring for the child. Although, mm -hmm. you know, the child may never return to you. The child may never call you mom. The child may never call you dad. Mm -hmm. But the amount of love that they spend with the child, you know, from life all the way to death, whether it's a sudden death or, I don't know, end of many years later. Yeah, it's, it's just very inspiring. Right. It's a, it's a reality. I don't think they need our pity because it's just, it's just life. It's just what happens. Mm -hmm. But it's reality. And I'm, I'm glad I get to see reality as a mm -hmm. whole. Yeah, yeah. And not like be too comfortable. Do you think that majority of us Singaporeans are too comfortable and we don't see this side of life? Mm, not all lah. Maybe some years. Uh. I mean, there are very privileged people around us, but not everybody. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, if you're talking about special needs, it has to do with the level of awareness as well. I think sometimes it's not that people are deliberately ignorant or that they don't care. Number one, it could be that they're just not aware of the struggles or what's happening. And granted, because everybody has different jobs, right? You need to keep the economy going. It's a very important part of life. Yeah. Uh, the awareness may not be there because you don't know the person. And if you don't know a person, naturally, you won't feel as much you yeah. know, as compared to if you actually know the family. And number two, I don't think everybody can feel so much for everything. You know, mm. there are actually a lot of non-profits in Singapore. There are the deaf community, the visually impaired community, special needs. And then now recently with the COVID, there's a migrant worker community that needs help. Mm. There are a lot of people that need help in Singapore. Yeah. yeah. And I don't think everybody can pour resources equally into each sector and each segment. Yep. To a certain extent, you go with the, <clears throat> the one that resonates the most with your beliefs and your values and, and the ones that you feel the most for. Mm -hmm. so I guess it's just very natural. You know, some people feel more for special needs. You know, they, their heart goes out to kids with disabilities. So they choose to volunteer with special needs. Some people, you know, they, they feel for the migrant worker community. So they are fighting for their rights and, and financial help. Mm -hmm. So it's about so personal... It really, yeah, it really, yeah, beliefs and conviction. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Yeah. So you mentioned COVID-19. How has that been as a special education teacher? Like, how do you still um, handle the students? Um, we do, like, stuff online. So mm. we do upload things online. Because this right. year I'm teaching, like, the mainstream education to kids with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So we uh, do upload things online. But, of course, we have to keep it interactive because their attention span may not be as long. Okay. And we need to keep it simple. Instructions have to be very clear such that they can navigate it independently. So um, for my students, most of them, they are quite independent, but they might need some help with you know technology, clicking into this, clicking into that. Mm. Same for mainstream kids. But I think they require a little bit more support than the mainstream kids sometimes. Right. So we need to keep instructions concise, easy to understand, such that it helps them to continue learning. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, COVID-19 COVID has been a very good learning lesson for us teachers. Okay. Because it's rethinking education, you know, it's like shifting your perception of how education needs to be like. In the past, education was always in a traditional classroom. You sit down, right. the teacher talks. Mm. Yeah, even in school, when we were in school or in, I don't know, poly or uni, I didn't pay attention to the teacher all the time. I mean, there are times where we just zone out, we fall asleep, we use handphone or we eat sweets in class. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, we pass notes around in class. So I understand like the, the structure that we've been brought up in. Mm -hmm. But if students are still able to continue learning digitally during COVID-19, then it makes us wonder how how effective a traditional classroom is and whether we can support students with other kinds of technology. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Instead of a traditional I lecture, you listen. <laughs> it doesn't really work. Not it doesn't always work. 
Yeah. There, there are certain things you have to do in class, face to face with teacher. But, I mean, it opens up our world uh, to see how we can do things a bit differently. Yeah. yeah. I think things are going to be very different after this whole COVID-19 episode. Like, I think the way companies work... So, so can I pick your brain then? <laughs> what, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah. You mentioned, uh, like, the ways company work. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, I think the fact that now so many of the companies are working with their employees uh, working from home, right? The whole mindset is going to shift to, like, do they really need to come to report to the office from 9 to 5 to be able to deliver yeah. work, right? So, yeah. I think at some point, companies can also go down the route where, you know, maybe it's three times a week rather than five days a week where you need to come to the office. Or maybe even once a week just for the meetings and then the rest you can do it at home, you know? I think that's going to uh, start to shift people's mindset. Like, you know, working at home is just as productive as working in mm. the office itself. And I think like mm. uh, education is also going to change. Uh, like you mentioned, I think during our time as well, we had, um, was it SARS during our time? I yeah, remember. I was primary four. Yeah, so we had SARS ongoing. And then after that, I remember we had to stay home for a bit, right? But it wasn't to yeah. this extent. Uh, yeah that uh, you know there's home-based learning everything has to go through technology and technology wasn't as advanced then so mm. i think with this whole uh current situation and circumstances it's going to force education also to take into the new modern rather than traditional route of uh learning I agree. yeah i agree you know like we've seen reports of how other countries are implementing like a four-day work week or was it four days or three days i can't mm. remember which country I think someone in somewhere in Europe, they are okay. implementing like a four day work week and then a three day rest or one day work from home arrangement, something like that. Ah, so I think yeah. it, it was debated <clears throat> like, should we do something like that? Are people hmm. still as productive? Now that people are being forced into this situation, I think a lot of companies will be relooking into the possibility of alternative arrangements hmm. yeah. like that. Yeah. And I also think like, uh, I'm not sure about other countries, but at least here in Singapore, I think the way <laughs> grocery shopping is going to change after this. COVID-19. Yeah. Did like, you know? Mm-hmm. Sorry, you go ahead no, before I say it. Did you know that Grab Mart and Panda Mart exist? I know, I didn't. I didn't know until recently. <laughs> Let me take the liberty to show you. Okay. So, apparently, now you can do, like, convenience shopping through your mobile phone app. You mean this is not Yeah, this is not sponsored by any company. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just showing partly. Yeah, so, like, do you know, like, those, was it, you know, like, Cheers, Fair Price Extra, those, mm-hmm. those ones from the petrol stations? Yep. They are having Grab Mart now, and it's delivered to you in, I think, like, 20 minutes or something. You can wow. order like your milk. You can mm. order your biscuits. You can order alcohol. Not wow. well, that it's relevant to you. <laughs> but, <laughs> so it, it comes to your house very quickly. Mm. Grab Mart. Grab Mart. Yeah, all right. I think grocery, grocery shopping is going to change. Yeah. I think a lot more people will opt for grocery shopping. You don't even need to carry it home. Yeah. And I think also more importantly, yeah. because of this current situation, the older, I put it nicely, the older generation, right? The aunties and the uncles. Now that they can't go to the supermarkets, now that they can't go to the wet markets, they are forced into actually downloading this app and getting their yeah, groceries. I think you're right. So I think you it's going right. to change the landscape of grocery shopping after this. Like even my mom is suddenly using uh, the NTC, the Seng Siong app. <laughs> like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Mm-hmm. It's actually very scary, like how. how how much technology is influencing the way we work. Mm. So I really wouldn't be surprised if like 50 years from now, we have robots like flying around. <laughs> 50? <laughs> you know, like, I think it's more than 50. Yeah, you know like those robots flying around, then like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we will not exist. The civilization will end. Humans will be a people of the past. I don't know. AI. <laughs> Artificial intelligence. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right. I think 
that was a, a great conversation, Esther. We've covered a lot. You've shared a lot of your experiences. Thank you so much for that. Uh, really deep yeah. insights, really deep experiences, deep learnings. Uh, uh, and I especially okay. love your <laughs> your stories about the special education. I think that's uh, really touching. Aww. Yeah. So yeah. thank you thank so much you for coming for on. having me on your show. Oh, you're welcome. It is my pleasure to be <laughs> part of this uh, popular network. <laughs> What's the name of the show, Esther? Deep Culture. Okay. <laughs> Sign up for Deep Culture. Like, subscribe, share, send the world more inspiration. <laughs> All right, do do my closing. Do my closing for me in that accent. Okay, I could do that. <clears throat> so, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, thank you for listening to this podcast. If you like this podcast, please like, subscribe, and follow us in Google Podcast, Spotify, YouTube, and our channel on Instagram, Inspire YouTube, and Deep Culture. If you like to see more of such characters on this show, please drop us a comment and we will reach out to the relevant individuals. Other than that, thank you for watching. Have a good day. Stay home, stay safe in COVID-19. Thank you. Perfect, Esther. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, guys. For those of you who have enjoyed it, please follow us or subscribe. Uh, and if you want more of this content, let us know in the comments and we will see you again next time on Deep Culture. Thanks again, Esther. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. <laughs>